The last part that we were talking about um, was the second part of the types of limitations <clears throat> for particular gas. We had perfusion limited, which was the nitrous oxide that we talked about first. And now we're talking about our diffusion limited. Perfusion limited gases, by definition, are gases that are able to cross across the alveolar membrane into the capillary bed and reach equilibrium in terms of their partial pressure between the alveolized air and the gas that is present in the bloodstream before you actually pass through the entire distance of the capillary. A diffusion limited is one that cannot do that because the problem is that there is either a low driving force or there is some kind of inability or difficulty with getting that gas across that alveolar, those seven different layers that we have to pass through, with the vacant membranes and the interstitial fluid and then the endothelial cells <clears throat> to get into the capillary bed. So nitrous oxides are an example of a perfusion limited. Fortunately, so are oxygen and carbon dioxide. Our example of a diffusion limited one is the carbon monoxide that we started talking about last time. The main reason for that is because carbon monoxide has a very high affinity for hemoglobin. It can bind to hemoglobin, which means that any carbon monoxide that comes across the, uh, that comes across the membrane is not actually going to contribute very much to the actual contribute actually to the value of the partial pressure that's found in the plasma because it immediately gets taken up by red blood cells and bound to hemoglobin. The same basic principles are going to apply that we saw last time when you have a change in the diffusion capacity. Diffusion capacity if it is a normal value of one, you're looking at here. If you cut it in half, so you're cutting that down, <clears throat> dividing by two, what happens to the probability that you're going to reach equilibrium by the end of the time the blood is in contact with the alveolar area? It's cut in half, okay? You're gonna end up actually having a lower partial pressure by the time you get all the way along that capillary and all possibility of gas exchange is now expired, okay? If you double the diffusing capacity, it's going to move twice as fast, or it's twice as likely to get across the membrane and into the blood. You're gonna increase that chance. The only time you might ever see carbon monoxide reaching equilibrium is if it is artificially hot, okay? Because typically, the big issue is that you have such a low driving force. The partial pressure differs between the air that you're breathing in and the fact that you have none in your body, hopefully, is that there is not really much of an impetus for it to cross across that membrane. And so the diffusion itself is relatively low. Same thing is going to happen if you alter blood flow. <clears throat> if you move it very, very slowly, artificially slowly, it's creeping along then most likely you could get a little bit closer to reaching equilibrium with the partial pressure than the entire way. More often than not, <clears throat> it's still going to be a diffusion limited gas and you will still see the same effect. If you cut the flow rate in half, it's moving slower. There's more contact time, with the wall, there's more chances that these gas molecules are gonna be able to diffuse across the membrane and get into the dissolved compound. Carbon monoxide, of course, as I said, is going to typically bind to hemoglobin, but if you give it enough time, it can generally build up some of that partial pressure. So that's kind of a review from last time. Big difference is whether or not you get equilibrium between the alveolar partial pressure and the partial pressure of that particular gas in the blood by the time you get to the end of the alveolar, alveoli and capillary contact, okay? It takes about three quarters of a second, so it's not a whole lot of time, but fortunately for oxygen and carbon dioxide, they are perfusion limited. So if, even if you happen to increase your blood flow rate you would be able to still reach equilibrium by the time you get to the end. Okay, so anybody have any questions on the summary of diffusion limited and perfusion limited before we get into the 
the rest of the sentence. LVMR, PO2, and PCO2. What we're really looking at is the ratio between how quickly you're ventilating and how quickly your blood is drawn. Okay, the rate at which you get oxygenation or remove carbon dioxide from your blood is going to be determined by the ventilation rate and the perfusion rate. So Q refers specifically to blood flow, therefore it's perfusion of blood into those regions of the capillary bed for gas exchange. They are going to be inversely related, the PO2 and the PCO2. Typically, if you have a high PO2, your PCO2 is going to go down. When your PO CO2 is high, your PO2 is going to go down. Why? Part of it has to do with the regions that you're in, whether you're in uh, systemic tissues, and you're metabolically active or you're in the lungs and you have a high partial pressure of oxygen, the other part is that they both bind to the same spots of hemoglobin. So if one of them coming in is going to pick off the other, um, the other gas that's bound, that gas is now available to diffuse out and it's gonna lower the concentration. If you were to increase your VQ ratio, that means that you are elevating the ventilation compared to perfusion. So greater degree of breathing at a constant blood flow would be an example of that. So what's, what's that gonna do? You're breathing faster, but your blood flow hasn't changed. What are you gonna be blowing off more of? CO2. You're gonna be blowing off more of CO2, and you're going to end up having a lower alveolar PCO2. You're going to have a higher PO2. <clears throat> so hyperventilation specifically is going to look at a concentration or a partial pressure of CO2 that is less than 40. Hypoventilation would give you a partial pressure of carbon dioxide that is a little bit greater than 40. If you decrease your VQ ratio, so that's your ventilation perfusion ratio, let's say that your perfusion stays the same and your ventilation drops. Okay? What is what are you most likely to see in terms of the capillary blood partial pressure as it gets into the arterial side? You're not ventilating as rapidly. You're ventilating relatively low, but the perfusion is staying roughly the same. Are you adequately saturating that blood with oxygen? Yes. yes. Okay, so your partial pressure of oxygen is gonna go down and you're gonna start seeing hypoxic conditions entering into the arterial <coughs> circulation on the systemic side. It's probably more aptly referred to as hypoxemic because hypoxemia is low oxygen tension in the blood. Hypoxia would be low oxygen in the tissues themselves. <clears throat> Sometimes they're used interchangeably. But decreasing your VQ ratio is going to result in a, an inadequate <coughs> gas exchange and the retention of more CO2 at the expense of oxygen because you're not ventilating <coughs> fast enough or sufficiently enough in order to get oxygen into the bloodstream and take out and blow off that CO2, okay? The VQ ratio right now we're talking about as a whole, but it can, be, it can change based on the region of your lungs. So that's the part we're gonna talk about next. How does the VQ ratio change throughout your breathing cycle? How does it change throughout different regions of your lungs? And what happens if you have a problem in one part of your lungs? How would your body compensate for that? So that's basically what we're gonna spend the rest of the time um, discussing. But first, we have to talk about your um, PO2 and the alveoli. The first thing to take into account is what we're really looking at is how much of the partial pressure of oxygen in your alveoli is going to be due in part to the inspired oxygen and in part due to the oxygen consumption. That is this latter portion here. That's your oxygen consumption. <clears throat> The oxygen that's consumed 
specifically is looking at the concentration of PCO2 that is going to remain in the arterial circulation. Okay, so this is whatever's in the arterial circulation divided by what's called the respiratory exchange ratio. The respiratory exchange ratio is the amount of CO2 that is produced divided by the amount of O2 that you are taking in. Typically, it's gonna be less than one because we tend to breathe a lot more oxygen than we produce CO2, okay? Um, the example here is 0.8. That number, if you are at rest or at relatively low intensity exercise, can give you an indication of the type of fuel you're burning. Something that's relatively close to that, around like a 0.7 or so, means that you're, you're tending to use fats as more of an energy source. If it drops down to about 0.1, you're tending to use more carbon um, carbohydrates. The only time you'll really see it above one, where you're actually producing more CO2 than you are consuming oxygen is during high intensity exercise. And it's not exactly accurate because one of the things that happens during high intensity exercise is you're actually releasing some of the CO2 in your body's buffer systems. So it's not just the carbon dioxide that you're producing by your tissues under high intensity exercise, it's that in combined with the parts that's being released from the body's buffering system to account for changes in the amount of organic acid you're producing, and you end up with CO2 that you can blow off as a way to reduce all that extra acid from increased metabolic rate, okay? So you might see something upwards of 1.1, 1.2 under high intensity exercise for that respiratory exchange ratio. <laughs> but if you want to calculate the alveolar partial pressure, you have to take whatever the value is that you inspired, and remember that's humidified. That's why it's 149 instead of 159 right, at sea level. Because you have to take into account the fact that you're humidifying that air. And then you subtract the partial pressure in the arterial circulation that you have of carbon dioxide divided by the respiratory exchange ratio. For this example, we end up with an alveolar partial pressure of, <clears throat> excuse me, 99. In a normal person, <coughs> you should have alveolar and arterial partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide being equal. Because it's a perfusion limited gas, by definition, it should have reached equilibrium for the partial pressures before that blood has finished passing through that pulmonary capillary duct. Why are we so fast? Is this time? <laughs> I don't know if I'm confusing you or if you guys are just like really dull. <laughs> yeah. So is there a similar relationship? For CO2, is it just the oxygen in the, like, whatever the partial pressure in the alveoli is? Um, so, you mean for the, the alveoli in the arterial? Yeah, that's right on the top. It's the O2. Is there like a similar one for CO2? Oh, um, I'm actually not sure. I'm sure that you could probably figure one out. I don't know what it is because typically what we're looking for is um, how oxygenated your blood is. We know that we're constantly going to be producing CO2, so we know that our CO2 level is going to be at a specific level based on the breathing rate. And the question is, are you getting enough oxygen? Which is what it can really change based on elevation, based on uh, ventilation rate, perfusion rate. If you have a blood clot going into the or if you have a Congestion or things like that, the problem is usually getting oxygen in because you're constantly going to produce CO2. So there probably is. I just don't know what it is. Yeah. Is there a different balance for heart and fat or carbohydrates? Yeah. Do you use high fat loss for that balance for the trans fat or trans carbohydrates? So um, that would go more into like the biochemistry of metabolism when you start talking about. Um, specifically, what is the oxidation, the beta oxidation process for breaking down your fatty acids to produce the acetylcholine so that it can enter into the uh, TCA cycle and then also beta phosphorylation? The amount of CO2 that's produced as a byproduct of breaking down fat compared to the byproduct of CO2 produced from breaking down carbohydrates just means that you have a, um, a different ratio of the amount of CO2 that's actually produced as that metabolism occurs compared to the amount of oxygen that you're using. <coughs> um, Sorry. 
say what R is like? <coughs> R is like over there? Yeah. Uh, the R is the it's the ratio of the amount of oxygen that you are or sorry amount of oxygen that you're consuming compared to the amount of CO2 that you produce. So the CO2 produced in the numerator and the oxygen that you're consuming in the denominator. So it has to do with the amount that you're taking in. So remember when we did fixed the fixed method for effective cardiac output, we looked at oxygen consumption. So how much are you breathing in per unit time? and how it should equate to whatever your tissues are using, that's your oxygen consumption. That would be in the denominator. Whatever CO2 you're producing based on what the substrate is of your metabolism would be in the numerator. And usually, our oxygen consumption is higher than the amount of CO2 that we are actively producing. Partially because a lot of that, some of that CO2 goes into our uh, bicarb buffering system. So it can sort of be, um, it's not necessarily contributing to the part that you're blowing off. <clears throat> okay. All right, so based on that, take a chance here and see if you can calculate um, for a person who is at rest. They are seated and they are breathing from a tank that has 45% oxygen. Take a second and see if you can figure out. I put the equation down here. <coughs> so the inspired minus the PCO2 over the R. Assume that your R is completely okay. Okay. Pointing out that um, we went to look up the uh, oops, sorry the respiratory exchange ratio for the um, use of carbohydrates, and I must have written it down wrong. That it would be one instead of point one. So that's not something that I would expect you guys to know. I just was a little extra information that it can vary based on the nature of the thing. Okay. 
Okay. Any last minute submissions? All right, we're gonna stop you. Correct answer is as close to 270 as you can get. So, anybody wanna walk us through how you got that? Nobody? What do you start with? 760. Okay, 760 minus 47, because it's committed by air, gives you about 713, right? 713 is the total barometric pressure minus the water vapor. What would you multiply that by to get the oxygen pressure pressure? 0.45, because in this case, they are inspiring from 45% oxygen instead of the 21 that you get from atmospheric air. Okay. So this is a condition where you have to change that inspired PO2 value in order to accommodate for the fact that you're not breathing atmospheric air. Okay, They're breathing out of a tank, so instead of 0.21 being your fraction, now it's 0.45. So what does that give you? About 320, 321. Then you would just plug that in. 321 would be inspired PO2 minus that PCO2, which is typically 40, um, over R. And I said R would be the point. Okay. That 40 is the arterial, which should be equivalent to the alveolar PCO2, because you've already gone through gas exchange. So you should have values on the arterial systemic side of 100 for your partial pressure of oxygen and 40 millimeters of mercury for carbon dioxide. So 40 over eight, you would subtract that and you come up with actually 271, okay? Uh, when this is assigned for review, usually if it's a calculation, I'll put the calculation and how you arrived at that as an explanation. Um, let me know if that doesn't show up for some reason because apparently when I assigned the class, lecture file, um, the questions didn't show up at first. So please let me know if that doesn't show up right when I assign it. <coughs> All right, so if you wanna look at the amount of your vent production and ventilation, specifically looking at the rate at which you are breathing, not necessarily as it relates to the amount of O2 that you're consuming, this is sort of like the other equation, except it's gonna give you the calculation that you want for carbon dioxide, but it's not gonna involve the respiratory exchange ratio. It's specifically involving your CO2 production and your alveolar ventilation. K is 0.863. It is really just there, it is a constant, in order to account for the fact that you have different units. And I don't expect you to memorize that constant. If I'm gonna have you calculate this, I will give you that, okay? That's not the important piece to know about all this stuff. Um, that constant helps to kind of equate the units that you're gonna be using during this calculation. So basically all this is telling you is the relationships. What I want you to understand is the relationships between what happens if you start to breathe faster or if you start to breathe slower, what does that do to the partial pressure of CO2? And intuitively, if you start to breathe faster, you should cut that value in half. Why? Because you're blowing off more of the CO2 as the blood is passing through the pulmonary capillary bed. Remember, these are on the arterial side. So systemic arterial or alveolar partial pressures that you find, excuse me, after that gas exchange has occurred. If you cut ventilation in half, then your PCO2 is going to double, okay? inverse relationship between assuming that you have no real change in CO2 production. Okay, so you're sitting at rest, so your CO2 production hasn't changed, and all of a sudden you start to breathe faster, you're gonna find that you're blowing off more CO2 and you're gonna end up with a lower PCO2 in your systemic circulation, which will do what to your pH? It'll raise it, okay? If you slow down and cut ventilation, in half, your PCO2 is going to increase, which means your pH is going to go down. We are going to cover all of the pH and the acid-base balance. It's actually the last lecture at the end of the renal unit. 
but I want to introduce a little bit of it now so that it's at least a little familiar by the time we get there. Okay, so what happens under conditions where your metabolic rate <coughs> is actually changing, but your alveolar ventilation has not? What would you expect to see? I'm going to stop you because most of the people seem to get where we're going with this. <laughs> All right, good. So now let's get into what is actually happening to your alveolar gases and your blood gases as blood is passing along those capillary beds from that 0% until that 100%, those figures that we were looking at before. We're going to look at changes that you see in the content of the blood in terms of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay, so starting up at the top, we have our inspired air values up here. We're going to assume no carbon dioxide, zero partial parts of carbon dioxide, which is very, very small. The fraction is like 0.03%, so it's really, really low. Um, so roughly zero for CO2, about 160 for the partial pressure in dry air at sea level. That number is going to change when we start talking about high altitude physiology. But for right now, we're looking at the 760 times 0.21. It gives you the value that you would have for this. It's actually 159 point something, so about 160. The air that you're going to breathe in up here is your inspired air, which is humidified. Okay, that's the humidified air. So that is taking into account that 760 minus those 47 millimeters of mercury. That is the partial pressure of water vapor at body temperature. That brings it down to about 149, 150 for the partial pressure of oxygen. Before any gas exchange, this is your inspired air. So there's no gas exchange yet. This is just what's coming in to your conducting airway where it's humidified, it's warmed up, and it's getting ready to enter into the alveoli. Okay? On your deoxygenated pulmonary arterial side. So this is your systemic venous circulation that's come back through the right heart, out through the right ventricle, into the pulmonary arterial circulation. Your values roughly are 40 and 45, 46 for CO2, okay? PO2 will be 40 millimeters of mercury. PCO2 is 45 to 46. On your systemic <coughs> venous circulation, which would be the same as your pulmonary arterial circulation. Why? No more capillary beds after you go from systemic capillary and create this, and then heading back into the pulmonary arterial circulation. When gas exchange is occurring from that inspired air of that 150 and zero values for your O2 and CO2, um, respectively, exchanging with the gas, the end result is oxygenated blood that will give you, oops, sorry. that will give you a value of about 100 for your PO2 and 40 for your PCO2. You will note that that is the same that you see in your alveoli. Because it's perfusion limited, you've reached equilibrium by the time that blood has gotten all the way across the capillary bed and is going into pulmonary venous circulation and then through the left side of the heart into systemic arterial circulation. Okay, oxygenated blood will typically have a PO2 of 100, a PCO2 of 40, and it will be the same as what you see in the alveoli because you've reached equilibrium. We're gonna see changes in this based on changes in the direction of blood flow, so how if blood flow is able to 
pass through certain blood vessels if they had, tend to get blocked or obstructed for some reason. We'll see a change if there's a problem with air entering into these alveoli. Okay, this is what you should see under normal circumstances. Now, the part that I want to show up here, or point out here, is specifically looking at our alveolar ventilation on the x-axis and the partial pressure of oxygen that is on the y-axis. Given two different metabolic rates, the red solid line is a consumption or a metabolic rate that re results in a consumption of oxygen or usage of oxygen of 250 mils per minute. That was the same value that we had in the fixed calculation for effective um, cardiac output. <laughs> That would be something that you would have at rest. If you ramp that up four times, we'll put it up to a thousand mils of oxygen per minute. What happens to the partial pressure at a given ventilation? So a given ventilation rate, what happens to the partial pressure? So at about seven and a half and eight, what's the partial pressure here versus here? Much lower, right? Why? Because you're more metabolically active, which means your tissues are consuming more oxygen. So the partial pressure itself is actually going to go down if you don't change your ventilation rate. Okay? So if you are shifting metabolic <coughs> rates in order to make sure that you are reaching the same partial pressure of oxygen, you need to increase the rate in which you're breathing. You need to increase the turnover of oxygen coming in and carbon dioxide leaving. Now at the bottom, it just it refers to like, the definition of if you were to hyperventilate above your knees or hypoventilate below your knees, by definition, it would be an elevated or a depressed level of alveolar PO2 above or below that 100 millimeter for your knees. So that's just so, sort of for reference. Your normal operating point is going to be um, a ventilation rate of about four or five. Typically four is a little bit more accurate for sort of the average person, especially for a lot of our calculations. Um, your, we had a standard cardiac output, which was what? What do we say that on average cardiac output would be? Five liters per minute. The standard ventilation rate would typically be about four liters of air per minute. Okay, so. If you don't increase your ventilation rate, then you won't be able to achieve that normal 100 or so millimeters of mercury that you would expect to see in your pulmonary venous blood. It's the same basic uh, effect that you see with CO2, except it's inversely related. Normal operating point is gonna put you down around 40, and these two are gonna look at different levels of production, okay, the excretion rate. Solid's gonna be at rest. Your dashed blue line is going to be when you are actually producing a lot more. So what happens if you are producing a lot more CO2 and you don't change your ventilation rate? You end up with a much higher concentration or partial pressure that's present in the blood going into the systemic tissue. So the importance of that VQ match, the blood flow match, the production match, and the <coughs> ventilation rate to account for that these feedback mechanisms are really, really important to make sure that you don't start to end up with massive acidosis just because you decide to exercise. If you didn't increase your ventilation rate, that's what would happen. Anybody have any questions on this? I like graphs and I like equations, and some people don't, so I tend to put up both so that there are a few different ways to express the same piece of information. Um, so part of that will depend on, this is looking at specifically a change. The other thing you have to take into account is cardiac output. So um, the actual blood flow itself, because you're gonna be looking at the, the, the ventilation rate as it relates to blood flow. So if their cardiac output, if their blood flow is actually slower, then they don't necessarily have to increase their ventilation rate. You know what I mean? So if you are, if you have a higher metabolic rate and your blood flow slows down, then your ventilation rate can stay roughly about the same. 
So it's the ratio of how your flow is passing across the pulmonary circulatory system and the ventilation rate. Is it going to match the rate at which the blood is flowing to get rid of all the CO2 that you're producing? Okay, so now we're at the crux of everything else that we're going to talk about. Ventilation versus perfusion. Ventilation specifically is the convective air movement, which refers to the air that is actually moving through your conducting airways. There's no gas exchange there, plus the gas exchange that is happening between the atmosphere and the alveoli. Okay, so you are getting gas exchange occurring across that alveolar wall. Okay. That ventilation is the movement of air into your lungs and then out of your lungs. The perfusion is the movement of the blood that's going to carry that gas to and from the lung. So the blood flow is going past the lung. So we're looking specifically at the rate at which air is being introduced to participate in gas exchange, to oxygenate your blood and remove CO2, and the rate at which blood is flowing through your pulmonary circulation. How many people know what anatomical dead space is? You've heard of it before, right? By definition, it's whatever part is never, ever, 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 ever going to be involved in gas exchange. Conducting airways, great example. They have no alveoli, they can't participate in gas exchange. That's anatomical dead space. Just by the mirror anatomy of that vessel, or of that airway, there will be no exchange of gases between the air that's entering in that airway and the blood that is passing through it. Okay? <laughs> Typically, a person that has a tidal volume of about half a liter will have about 150 mils of anatomical dead space. That means that only about 350 mils of the air that you're breathing in is actually coming from outside. This figure looks at specifically the shuttling of air between the conducting airways and then the part of the lungs where you're actually going to have gas exchange. So on the left, we have after you have breathed out, so you're at functional residual capacity on the left, okay? Your tidal volume is 500 mils. You have 150 <coughs> of stale air. Okay? That stale air means that that was the last 150 <coughs> that you breathed out. Right? Because right before you're getting ready to breathe in, you had to breathe out. So you've already equilibrated that with your blood. Okay? The last 150 mils that you breathe out basically get stuck in your conducting airways. <coughs> okay? So when you take your next breath in, you're going to take in a full 500 mils for your tidal volume. And here it shows you your lips. Okay? You're going to take in that 500 mils. But in order to get that down to your alveoli, the first thing that has to happen is that stale air has to be pushed into the lungs. So every time you take a tidal breath, you're actually first reintroducing the air you've just expired that's stuck in your anatomical dead space back into your lungs. Then the rest of that 500 mils that's entering into your lungs is about 350, leaving this last 150 of fresh air Okay, inspired air that again is stuck in your conducting airways, the ones that don't participate in gas exchange. With me so far? Okay. That last 150, after all this gas exchange is going to occur, you have the air mixing in your lungs. And then this value here is the first part to leave. So when you breathe out, that 500, again, 500 in, 500 out. The first 150 is actually the same composition of your inspired air. Okay? 
because it never actually reached a part of your lungs that has alveoli, so that it can't participate in any gas exchange. It's just hanging out, keeping your airways open. The first 150 you breathe out is that fresh air, and then the rest of that 350 is that diluted mix of whatever it is that you happen to have breathed and mixed in from the previous 150 exhale air and the fresh that you inspired, you've diluted that out. And now 350 mils of that is getting expired. And once again, you have that 150 of stale air at this new composition that is hanging out in your conducting airways, waiting to be shoved back down into the alveolar region along with your next pedal volume. How do we feel about that? Do we have any questions? Because I'm going to use this to test for anatomical versus physiological dead space. None so far? Okay. So effectively what you have is a piece of stale air. Oops. And a piece of fresh air that are just constantly being shuttled back and forth. You have 150 mils that's going to be coming up through the conducting airways and back down, and then up and then down and up and down. This composition is going to change because it will mix every time you take a new breath in. But the same thing happens with that other 150 that's from inspired air. It gets stuck on the way in, and it's the first part expired. And so you have a you're basically shuttling 150 mils of fresh air. Anything in those conducting airways, that anatomical <coughs> bed space does not participate in gas exchange and stays the same composition that it was, okay? So only 350 mils of an average of 500 mil tidal volume is actually fresh air that reaches the alveoli to participate in that gas exchange to help you introduce oxygen to your blood and remove carbon dioxide. So the anatomical and physiological dead space, what is the difference between those two? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to use this talking about two different methods to calculate because they they could potentially be different between anatomical and physiological. Anatomical is what we're talking about right now. No possibility ever for this space to change as long as you are still healthy. I mean, unless you are going to open up and cut out some of your conducting airways. Okay, that's an anatomical change. All right, so. Two different series of, or pieces of 150 mils that are going to be shunted back and forth. How are we going to estimate this anatomical dead space? <laughs> it's the same basic principle that we had before when we did the nitrogen washout method, right? When we were looking at figuring out the residual volume. Except this time we're going to do it in a single breath. Okay? A single breath is going to tell you specifically your anatomical dead space. And the way that works is because we know that the amount of nitrogen that you have inside of your lungs is going to be the same as whatever it was that you've just been breathing. Okay? So for ease of numbers, they put in here that the value was about 75% because that's whatever they were breathing before they actually did this single inspiration, single expiration, and then measured the values of nitrogen. Nitrogen is what we're going to look at. It's not like nitrous oxide where it crosses the barrier. Nitrogen will not. It will stay inside your alveoli. It won't pass into the blood, despite the fact that it's inside your alveoli. So whatever nitrogen was present there in the beginning is going to come back out. Now, the important part of this, uh, let me see if I can space it. This is, called, this is Fowler's method, okay? Fowler's method is going to tell you this information about anatomical bed space. The important part here is that if we're going to specifically look at nitrogen levels, what is it that we have to breathe in? That pure oxygen. Okay, it's just like we did with the nitrogen uh, washout method. The only way you can wash out that nitrogen is if you're not breathing in and adding more nitrogen to the system. So in this case, you're taking in a single tidal volume of 100% oxygen. So what happens? The first 150 mils is, oh, 
The first 150 mil is going to be shunted in first, plus that 350 of pure oxygen. They're all going to mix. Okay? You get mixing happening because what happens? The gas is going to mix as soon as it gets into the lungs themselves, into the alveolar space. And then you have a meter over here that is going to be able to read the level of nitrogen in your expired. And it's going to show you at every point as the air passes through, you're going to see the change in nitrogen level show up on that uh, meter. What would be the nitrogen level that you would see in this first 150 mil? Zero. Zero, right? Because by definition, that is the pure oxygen that you breathe in, so there shouldn't be any nitrogen in it because it's stuck in your conducting airway. In theory, it didn't mix at all. So when you breathe it out, that should be a zero value. Once you get past that anatomical dead space, then you're going to start seeing this 350 mil. Oops, sorry. You're going to start seeing that 350 mil that will be that mixed diluted nitrogen plus the oxygen that you breathed in. So you're going to see a different value of nitrogen in that 350 mil. By definition, what do what does the gas in that 350 mil region represent? Where is it coming from? It's coming from which part of your lung? Conducting or alveolar? Alveolar. alveolar. Okay. So if you wanted to get a measurement of the partial pressure of whatever gas in the alveoli, you basically need to wait until toward the end, the latter two thirds of the expiration of a tidal volume in order to get past that dead air space. Okay? This is what it would look like, provided there's absolutely no mixing. You should see this instantaneous shift when we're looking at our concentration, oops, sorry, our concentration of expired air on the y-axis and the volume that is on the x-axis. DD, in this instance, refers to dead space volume, okay? That volume of air, you'll see, has a zero value of nitrogen. Why? Because it was pure air, pure oxygen that got stuck in your conducting airways that didn't have any mixing with the nitrogen that was present in the alveoli. So when you breathe it out, this volume from here to here should have zero and two. Okay? The alveolar air is going to show your value of nitrogen <coughs> that was present as you diluted that with the rest of the oxygen that you took in. Now, in theory, you would have this instantaneous shift. Does that actually happen? No, because it's never seen. But as you start to see a slight increase and a tapering off of the values of um, nitrogen, you will see a curve that looks like this. And A, A and B, the areas that are shaded, that darker orange and that darker gray, those areas should be equal. There's a little bit of mixing in the conducting airways that are immediately proximal to the alveolar airways. And so you get a little bit of gas mixing in there because there's no valve that's actually separating the two compartments. But the areas under these shaded regions, A and B, are going to be equal. So if you want to get a measurement strictly of alveolar air, you need to take your measurement somewhere over here. That's going to be pure alveolar air. If you want to get whatever the gas concentration is from your patient, 
you have to get it closer to the end of expiration because by definition that's going to be the air that actually made it to whatever alveoli they, alveoli they had that were inflated. What's the advantage of having a jet stream? Like wouldn't it be more difficult to have all conducting airways? All conducting? Like why not have all of your airway participate in the gas? Oh, because um, the structure of the alveoli that participate in gas exchange are very flimsy. Um, and basically, as you move down through, it's not just that it's humidifying, you also have production of a lot of cilia and mucus, and it protects you from anything that's coming in. And it has a lot more of um, your elastin and your collagen to strengthen those airways. When you get down to the areas where you actually have gas exchange, it's very, very flimsy. It's also very. Um, if you actually inspire something and got it all the way down to your alveoli and didn't trigger any of those reflexes to cough it back up, then it would most likely have a very easy time establishing an infection. So it has more to do with the fact that the structural, I guess the ultra structure that you would need is the cells that can participate in gas exchange in terms of how thin they are to allow this to be very efficient, wouldn't be very practical because you'd be much more likely to get a lot of upper respiratory infections if you had this very thin, non mucusy no cilia, no way of kind of getting anything out in order to help it participate in the gas exchange. Mucus and cilia and all that stuff kind of get in the way if you want to actually send gases across efficiently. That's a great question though. All right, so how are we so far with anatomical density? Good? All right, now our physiological dead space. Our physiological dead space is going to exploit the fact that we're going to use CO2. Okay? We're going to use CO2, and we don't have CO2 in the air we breathe. So the nice part about this is that you don't really have to worry about um, using any kind of experimental setup. This is Bohr's method. Okay? Fowler's method uses nitrogen, and you have to use a 100% oxygen tank in order to do that single breath. For estimating physiological dead space, we're going to use CO2. Okay? Again, same thing that we're going to do is we're going to start with whatever the value was of our CO2, about 5% for our normal alveolar <laughs> after um, equilibrating and breathing that out. You have about 5% of CO2 left. You are not breathing in any CO2. It is zero amount that is coming in. So same basic principle. You're going to breathe in that 150 mils of stale air. That's going to enter first. And then you'll get that 350 mils of fresh air that has no CO2 in it. Okay? That's just the air that you're breathing. You're measuring carbon dioxide that's present in the air coming in the room. So all you really need to do is measure the amount of CO2 that is coming out. Now, when we look very quickly at these values here for Fowler, the volumes of alveolar air and the concentration can be related with the total volume that you expired. You can figure out the dead space knowing that all of the expired air had to be that nitrogen. The same principle is going to hold true here. Any CO2 that shows up in the gas that you're breathing out, where did it have to come from? It had to come from the alveolar regions that already participated in gas exchange. Because you're not breathing any of it in, you're only breathing it out. So, if we're looking specifically at carbon dioxide, what information is this going to give you in terms of your overall dead space? It'll give you anatomical as well because you have CO2 free air that is still going to be um, removed because that was what you just breathed in. What does this 350 mils help to contribute to? What do you think would be the difference if you're using CO2 which by definition is air that participated in gas exchange and you have a set volume that is 
being excited. Anatomical plus what potentially could increase your physiological dead space? Where might you get dead space in the alveoli? Is it possible to have an alveolus that doesn't bridge a straight and gas chain? Maybe you don't have blood flow going this way. Air coming into that alveolus is not actually going to bridge a straight and gas exchange because there's a problem with the capillary that normally feeds that alveolus. If that happens, it's considered alveolar dead space because air is coming in, no gas exchange, air is coming back out. But technically, that region should participate in gas exchange. So your physiological dead space is actually your anatomical plus any alveolar dead space that is the result of alveoli that are not participating in gas exchange for some reason. Okay? So when we use CO2, this is coming, this is the total amount of carbon dioxide that is contributing to the air you're expiring, all of which had to come from alveoli that are perfused and are participating in gas exchange. So, this figure looks a little more convoluted, but we're going to walk through it. Starting with the legend on the y-axis. Same thing, we have the concentration of the expired air. On the x-axis, we have the volume of the expired air, okay? If you want to figure out the total amount, you take the volume times the concentration of CO2 in the expired air, right? That tells you the mass, the total mass of CO2 that is showing up in the air that's being breathed out, okay? Now, for these two regions, we still see the same basic pattern that we saw before where you have anatomical dead space, or physiological dead space in this case, then you have an instantaneous shift, and then you have alveolar air, okay? What you're actually gonna collect is the whole breath. Let's just measure the CO2 content of the entire breath, okay? If you measure the CO2 content of the entire breath, which is down here at the bottom, the United States Food and Rights Institute, right there. If you are specifically looking at the CO2 content of the expired air, it's going to tell you what is the total mass of CO2 molecules that have left the body. Right? These two areas show you the concentration that's present in your alveolar air and the concentration that's present in your expired air. What are you going to measure? Expired air, right? You can just collect that one breath, measure the overall content, and figure out what the concentration is, or what the ratio is of your dead space. The main reason for this is because if you look at these three different values that we have, let me see if I can find a color that will stand out a little better. All right, so if we want to look at what is the ratio of your dead space air, you have the amount of CO2 in your dead space, which should be what? Zero, right? Because your dead space is by definition not contributing to gas exchange. And since the air you're breathing in is zero amount of CO2, that should be zero. So that VD times the concentration of dead space CO2 that should be zero, okay? So if you take the amount of dead space of CO2 and the amount of CO2, sorry, the amount of CO2 here, sorry, that is contributed by the alveolar air, the alveolar air together will give you this total amount that's in your expired air. But, because the mountain in your dead space should be zero. Effectively, what you're looking at is the amount of CO2 from the alveolar air. That's the only source of CO2, your alveolar air. So you can take your total expired volume, subtract VD, which is what you don't know, 
multiply it by whatever the concentration is, and you will have that equal to the total expired volume times the concentration. Because this pink area has the same area as that hatch <coughs> area. Why? All of that CO2 had to come from the alveoli. None of it was contributed by that dead space. So if you set those two <coughs> equivalent to each other, which I wrote down not so neatly, so maybe I'll rewrite it. I should do that. Oh, I forgot something. All right, I'm going to rewrite this on the dot cam just so that it's a little easier to read. The equation that we're looking at, I think it's going to be, I apologize in advance, I'm trying to write angles. I will turn it for you, but I, I write angles when I write on the paper. I can't write flat. All right, so your VE minus VB times the concentration of CO2 in the alveolar air, okay? So that's the VFB. Right? This is the amount of CO2 that's contributed by alveolar air. The volume of your alveolar air is the total expired minus whatever your dead space is. Okay? That is going to be equal to the volume of your expired air times the concentration of your expired air. This is what you can easily measure. You take the total volume that you blew out, multiply it by whatever the CO2 concentration is in this. If you were to solve for this, which I already did earlier, so I'm just going to copy it down. If you were to multiply this through, you get your VE CO2 A minus VB CO2 A equals the same thing we saw on the right side. Okay, so if you were to multiply that through, what's one thing that you see that you can do? That VE is something that you're going to be able to factor out. Okay, what we want to get to is specifically looking at the ratio of VB to VE. We want to get this percent. We want to know how much dead space compared to the total expired volume do you have? Do you have 20%? Do you have 40%? Do you have 100%? Okay. So if you were to solve for this whole concentration, you end up with the expired um, C A oh sorry. Just rearranging this equation, you can pull that VE out and then divide by this, divide it by this, and you get the CO2 A over CO2 A. Okay. So the end result is this is going to cancel out to one. Okay. So since what we want to get is this ratio, basically just rearranging this equation gives you VE times the alveolar concentration minus the expired concentration equals VB times the alveolar concentration. Rearranging that by bringing VE over here, bringing that concentration over here, you end up with one minus this concentration, which is what's going to show up there. Okay, so the end result is this is your Bohr's method equation that will tell you the value you would get from dead space. But because you're specifically looking at 
CO2, you are looking at dead space by definition that is not participating in gas exchange, which might not just be anatomical. If you have some kind of uh, blood clot or and some kind of embolism, some kind of tumor that compresses a blood vessel, any reason why a blood vessel would not be able to allow blood to perfuse an alveolus, that alveolus is now wasted ventilation. Air comes in, no gas exchange, air leaves. Okay? So this equation can be used to get the value. Your partial pressure in your alveolar as 40 minus the total, which is 28, divided by 40 will give you that ratio. So under conditions where you have, uh, in this case, 40 minus 28 over 40, you get about, what, 30%? That means that 30% of that total air space is dead. Dead air space, okay? Physiologically. You could do Fowler's method to give you anatomical. But Bohr's method is the only one that's going to give you anatomical plus alveolar because it's specifically looking at a gas <coughs> that moves across the membrane during gas exchange. Okay? All right. So you don't necessarily have to respond to this because I think I just told you the answer. How does dead space uh, change during a pulmonary embolism, and which method would detect this change? Pulmonary embolism means blood clot in your blood vessels, so no perfusion. That means this is going to be alveolar dead space. So if it's alveolar dead space, can Fowler detect it? No. That's only for anatomical. Bohr's method is going to detect your alveolar dead space that contributes. All right. Now, when we're looking at alveolar ventilation, one thing I want to point out is specifically this curve here on the right. We're looking at our intrapleural pressure and the volume. Okay, so this is lung volume. You see how steep it is on the left side of that figure compared to the right? It kind of tapers off. What is change in volume over change in pressure? What parameter is that measure? Compliance, okay? Static compliance. How easy is it for a given change in pressure to cause a change in volume? The point I want to point out here is specifically the regional differences that you see in the lung. At rest, under normal circumstances, the apex of your lung is relatively hyperinflated, okay? The barometric pressure of about negative 10 means that you are starting up here. If you have a given change in pressure of five centimeters of water, you see a moderate increase in lung volume. Why? Because it's already pretty full. That really negative intrapleural pressure means that more air is residing in the apex, even at your FRC. When you have a lower part of your lung, down here near the base, the uh, intrapleural pressure is less negative. So there is less of that vacuum pull. It's relatively underinflated at FRC, which means that if you have the exact same change, five centimeters of water, you see a much bigger change in lung volume because it's a little bit more compliant. It's not very full. This is static compliance. It's relatively underinflated. So when you take in a breath of air, most of that air is actually going to fill the base of your lungs, which is good because you have more vasculature down there. About a quarter of all of the cardiac output coming from the right side is going just to fill the base of your lungs. Okay? A given change in intrapleural pressure can produce a much larger change in lung volume because of where it resides on this curve. Okay? So looking at a static pressure volume diagram, the base of your lung is more compliant than the apex because the apex at rest is typically more inflated. Perfusion itself, specifically, uh, we're gonna look at the uh, pulmonary circulation. We talked already about how it has a low pressure. Your pulmonary vessels are a little shorter. They're also a little wider, so the resistance is lower. 
If the resistance is lower, you don't need as high a pressure in order to be able to move that flow through at the same rate. You also have a relatively high compliance of your pulmonary vessels because it's receiving the exact same cardiac output that the left side is <coughs> All right, so your cardiac output between right and left is not different. If it were different, then you would have a back of a blood flow as it's moving through the system. Okay, so you have same cardiac output, but much lower pressure because there's a lot less resistance in the pulmonary vasculature. That said, that resistance is going to differ based on which type of vessel we're talking about and which point in respiration, uh, or sorry, ventilation that you're looking at. You have alveolar blood vessels and extra alveolar blood vessels. Your alveolar blood vessels are pretty much completely surrounded by alveoli. What happens to them when you breathe in? You're going to crush them a little bit, right? I mean, it's fine because they're not going to be completely closed off, but they are going to be crushed a little bit, which means that the more air that's in your lungs, the more likely you are to compress these vessels, which means your resistance will go up. On the extra alveolar blood vessel, what happens when you breathe in to your intrapleural pressure? You can track that diaphragm, and what happens to the pressure inside before you're taking the air in? Increase or decrease? Decrease, right? You contract it, you increase the volume, so your pressure goes down. So because these are not surrounded by alveoli, they are much more susceptible to that vacuum effect from the intrapleural pressure, which means that as soon as you contract and that pressure gets more negative, the extra alveolar are more likely to dilate. Okay, so the resistance will actually go down. So when we look at this value starting at FRC, oops, starting here at your FRC, at that dashed line, your resistance itself, that's the total that we're looking at up here. If you are below FRC, the biggest problem or the biggest contributor to that resistance is the fact that your extra alveolar vessels are dilated. That intrapleural pressure, as you move more and more negative, then you are going to have a higher resistance. But because you are increasing the volume up to FRC, it's kind of at its low point for the total resistance. It, it peaks or it drops out, bottoms out at your FRC. That dilation of those blood vessels means that resistance for the extra alveolar blood vessels is gonna drop precipitously between your residual volume and your FRC. That's the dominating effect that causes the overall resistance of pulmonary vasculature to decrease. As you start to increase your lung volume, so you're moving from FRC up to, well, your tidal volume or your total lung capacity, if you go all the way up to your inspiratory reserve, now you're starting to see the effect of the crushing of those blood vessels as the lungs start to inflate. Okay, because of that, any of the effect that you have of dilating the extra alveolar vessels is basically counteracted by the crushing of the alveolar blood vessels. So the overall resistance is going to increase, which is going to slow down flow to allow back exchange to occur. One of the other things that happens is we have two different things that will occur. We have recruitment and distension. Recruitment just means that more airways are going to open up. Distension means that whatever's open is going to expand. So just because you have an airway that's open doesn't mean it's actually conducting air. It's kind of like a soaker hose. Do we know what soaker hoses are? They're like garden hoses that have holes in them. If you don't put enough flow or enough pressure in there, there's no water that's going to come out of those holes. It's the same basic principle here. So you can recruit more vessels, and you can also distend those vessels in order to get your gas, uh, get the gas exchange to occur as flow is moving through the pulmonary system. We only have about, I think, yeah, we have about 10 more slides uh, on this material, so we'll finish that up um, on Tuesday, and then we'll get into the rest of the content.